Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Integrating Sources, part of an ongoing series in the Skill Builder workshops that will happen throughout the semester. Uh, in today's session, you'll learn about better techniques for quoting, paraphrasing, and, and integrating and utilizing sources and citations to enhance your research and writing. Uh, my name is Christopher Bishop. I'm a librarian at Agnes Scott that works closely with a number of academic departments to support student academic research. Thankfully, I have had the tremendous opportunity to work with both of my co-hosts, who are amazing students. And would you all like to introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll be in. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Trotman. I'm a senior at Agnes and a set of writing and speaking tutor. Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Sawyer here, uh, class of 22. And I've been with the Center for Writing and Speaking for two years now. As I said, this session will be recorded. Uh, it'll be up on the Skill Builder site, and also the slideshow presentation that we're going to use will also be there too. Um, so, for you to uh, use in the future, um, we're going to ask that as we go, if you could add questions to chat, and then we'll answer those. One of us will always monitor that. Um, and then towards the uh, end of our presentation, which we're planning for about an hour, we'll uh, answer all those questions. Although if, if something if something comes up and we feel like, okay, this is something we really need to answer in the instant, because maybe that context will be lost later, we'll definitely do so. But definitely put your questions in to chat as we go along. Um, and before we get started here, are there any questions as to the recording or distributing of these materials or anything like that? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So the presentation is going to include four areas of review. We're going to talk about effectively integrating quotes. We're also going to talk about um, paraphrases in your academic writing. Citations, that'll be how to use citations to avoid plagiarism when you're quoting and paraphrasing. And then we'll talk also about the CWS and the library and how you can make appointments with us um, and uh, the different kinds of support that we offer. And as we go along, we're going to have some this or that questions. So we want this to be hands-on and interactive. So we'll, pro we'll use emojis for that, which was um, Amaris and Leah's idea, which I thought was excellent. So you'll also see that. So first part, um, I am going to move the slides along and I believe Leah is going to start. Thank you, Chris. So hi, everyone. As Chris said, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, today, we're going to try to help you identify best practices, best ways, um, best strategies for integrating sources into your academic writing. So generally, we like to say that there are two main ways a writer can integrate sources into their work. They can either integrate quotes directly from a text that they have read into their writing, or they can paraphrase information from a text that they are reading into their writing. As we go throughout the presentation today, you will get a better sense of when and how to effectively integrate these sources into your academic writing using either one of those strategies. And what you will quickly come to learn today is that you can't always do one or the other, so we are also going to help uh, equip you with tools to best identify which one to do. So to kick us off, let's start with an example on how best to integrate quotes into our academic writing. Shown on the screen is an excerpt from my most recently completed international relations senior thesis. Um, so for context, I wrote on the applicability of public health solutions to gun violence in the Caribbean. So this specific section shown on the screen speaks to the causes of gun violence in the region. So that's the content you'll continue to see running throughout this entire example, as well as throughout this entire presentation. So I'm going to just take a quick pause right now to go ahead and read this to you, and then we'll dissect what each of these colors mean. So the section says, to understand the causes of gun violence in the Caribbean and why crime in the region has lasted so long, Edward Azar's protracted social conflict theory offers the best explanation. Developed in the 1970s, um, PSC argues that many conflicts currently active in the underdeveloped parts of the world are characterized by a blurred demarcation between internal and external sources and actors, multiple causal factors and dynamics reflected in changing goals, actors, and targets. In short, Azar states that conflicts are complex and do not solely exist because of state-to-state -state interaction and disagreement, 
Rather, conflicts exist because of many internal and external factors and actors that can sometimes be hard to individually define and identify because they overlap and appear at various points in time at varying degrees of involvement throughout a conflict. Conflict in the Caribbean um, specific to gun violence is no different. Both internal and external factors and actors cause gun violence in the Caribbean and Edward Azar's protracted social conflict theory offers the best framework to highlight these actors and factors. So that was a lot, but we knew that we had to read that out loud so you could really get a sense of what I'm about to say next. Notice the four different colors here within this example. These four different colors depict four different but essential sections that should be included in your academic writing if you hope to effectively integrate quotes into your work. Now I'm going to take some time to break them down for you. In red, what you see is an introductory phrase. In short, an intro phrase, you guessed it, introduces a quote. Um, it gives your readers context for the upcoming quote. I have noticed throughout my many years of writing, and I'm sure Maris and Chris have as well, that if you don't have an introductory phrase, your readers will get lost because one, they just in general have no context, but two, they will wonder why the quote was even included in the first place. And then they'll just start thinking about that question and not actually about what's written on the page. So in this blurb, I incorporate a quote about Azar's theoretical argument in my paragraph. And my introductory phrase here tells me and my readers why I incorporated Azar's theory, because I think it offers the best explanation to examining and understanding the causes of gun violence in the Caribbean region. So after you've inserted what's in red, the introductory phrase, you will then add in your own quote. So of course, you don't want to just plop your quote into any paragraph. You might have a few opening words like an independent opening clause, as you saw within my example, developed in the 70s. Um, really, it just depends on whatever makes most sense to you and what works in the context, but you want to make sure that you don't just plop that quote in, but rather you like embrace it with the other words around it. And then following the quote, you will then include an explanatory phrase, which is what you see here in green. This explains your quote to your audience. Most people stop after inserting their quote into their paragraphs, but trust me, you don't want to be those people. <laughs> to fully integrate a quote into your academic writing, you should also include an explanatory phrase. Um, explaining what your quote means to your readers. And as you see in the example on the screen, I explained Azar's theoretical argument within the green. And then lastly, you should include a phrase that connects the quote back to your thesis, your overall argument to your overall paper. If you don't include this phrase, essentially your quote becomes a little irrelevant, right? Because then your readers won't really know why you included this quote and why it was important to your argument. So as a result, quite frankly, the quote could become a little pointless. It could, it's just not as effective, right? Which is not what we want because we want our own work to have as much impact as possible. So be sure to include a phrase that connects your quote back to your thesis and overall argument. And this helps to ensure that your audience understands the quote's significance and also ensures that you as a writer are continuing to make a central argument throughout your entire paper. So as a recap, when you integrate quotes into your academic writing, be sure to have the following four sections, the introductory phrase, the actual quote itself, an explanatory phrase explaining the quote, and then a phrase that connects your quote back to your thesis, argument, and overall paper. Now I'm gonna hand this over to Amaris for a little bit of practicing. Um, Amaris is gonna lead us in a this or that game where we can practice these new skills. All right, thank you, Leah. Um, so the point of this, this or that exercise is to not only uh, test our knowledge to see if we can detect um, those four sections that Leah broke down for us, but also to, you know, assess our, what we think about the quality and the robustness of those individu individual sections as well. Um, so for the this or that game, you're going to use two emojis. The first one um, in your Zoom reactions. The first one is the voice emoji or the wow emoji, whatever you want to call it. And the second one is going to be the heart emoji. So for the this, for option one, um, I would ask you to use the voice emoji. And then for option two, the that, I would ask that you use the heart emoji. So we're going to give you all some time to look through both of these examples um, and then some time to choose. So here is the first one. Can you let them know, Amaris, our, what kind of things they want to be looking for? Yeah, absolutely. So you see that we have our colors here. Um, you want to make sure the introductory phrase is there. 
your explanatory phrase is there, your quote is there and make sure the quote is um, being you know, cited correctly. Um, and also connection to our thesis, right? Because that's the most important. If we don't have that, our quote is ultimately pointless. Um, so yeah, don't, don't not only look for to see if those things are there, but also, you know, look and see and ask yourself, is this enough? Would I include more here? Um, ask yourself those types of questions. And then Amaris, you let me know when you want me to go to the next slide. Okay. All right, Chris, I'm gonna say that you can go ahead. Okay. And option two. <clears throat> All right, I'm seeing some reactions. Please feel free to make a selection. And I think you can uh, move to the next slides, Chris, so then they can get a reminder of the emojis. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so remember that the shocked face, like, oh my God, that is, the you know this and then which is option one and then the heart is option two which do you think is kind of the better integration of a quote option one option two Okay, okay, I'm seeing some more. Let's get some more in there. What do y'all think? Okay. Yeah. Any more? Just a few more that we want to get in there. All right, that's okay. Um, so the those who participated, you did choose the correct answer. Um, the more um, optimal option is going to be option one. Um, and the reason that is, um, while all parts are there, the red, the green, the yellow, and the blue, um, there are, there's basically information missing from option two. So if you look at um, our red in the introductory phrase, um, in option one, we have Jeffrey Prager, a political science of the University of California, Los Angeles. In option two, we don't have that. Um, and it's actually very important for me in this instance to mention that Jeffrey Prager um, is in the field of political science because it is a political science paper, right? So you not only want to make sure people are credible, you know, that they, you know, that they're a scholar, they have a degree, but you also want to make sure they're credible for your field. Um, next, the explanatory phrase, that is actually the same in both options. So, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference there. Um, in our yellow, our quote here in option one, I have the in-text citation, right? And I've included the parenthetical at the end. In option two, um, the quotes are there. However, the parenthetical ain't there. So, you know, we don't, we don't know who exactly we're talking about here, even though I have mentioned Prager, but it's always better to, you know, be safe than sorry, right? Um, and then our blue. So basically I have, I have this quote here. In option one, you see that I have about three or four lines of analysis. In option two, I have maybe one line and that I would say that's not enough analysis for the quote that I've just chosen. Um, you know, you definitely wanna do a robust job of connecting back to your thesis and, you know, really analyzing your quote, pulling specific things out so that you can have a thorough analysis. Okay, so that, that is the reason why option one is the most optimal in this instance. So I'll pass it back to Leah. Awesome, thank you. Um, Chris, could you go ahead and move forward? I think actually, um, thank you, awesome. Okay, 
So we have chatted a little bit um, about how to effectively integrate quotes. And we've also gone through a little bit of how then to um, decipher when we do it right or when we do it wrong. Um, and obviously it's not just as clear cut as you know we made it seem today, but we tried to make it a little bit more nuanced um, so that you can get to really get into the weeds of things. Um, I actually think Amaris, you're gonna do this slide and then I'll do the one after. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, a little bit about why we quote incorrectly. So I would say as a tutor, the biggest one that I see is that, you know, the professor has required you to um, have a certain amount of sources, oftentimes see, you know, no less than 10 sources that you have to cite. Um, and, you know, in this case, students will start citing things that they can't, you know, they don't necessarily have the room to explore. They either don't provide enough analysis for it, or, you know, the quote is just you know, it doesn't directly relate to the topic at hand. Um, so it's just sitting there, no purpose. Um, and in that case, you have quoted incorrectly. Another way um, that we quote incorrectly is, you know, just having a lack of awareness of the scope of our assignment or paper. Um, in this instance, is, this kind of relates to number one, where you may drop a quote in your paper that doesn't directly relate to your topic. It might exist somewhere in your field, but it's just not relevant for the information that you've been discussing. In that case, another instance where we've you know, quoted incorrectly. And then an overall thing that I've just uh, noticed, and I'm sure Leah and Chris have noticed as well, is an overall lack of confidence in you know, um, students' academic voice. So you know you don't you don't feel like you have the language to maybe articulate what this scholar is saying. So you then rely on the voice of the scholar rather than trying to you know demonstrate your own um, understanding of what you're talking about. Um, so those are three reasons in which you know we do quote incorrectly. So I'll pass it to Leah. <clears throat> Thank you, Amaris. Um, so I, we actually want to turn your attention now to a little bit more of like the positive light. Like when do we actually quote, right? So now we've learned when we normally in quote, you know, quote incorrectly. Now we're going to talk a little bit about when and why we should actually quote correctly. Um, and so it's appropriate to quote, we say in like three different areas. So one, you will quote when the paraphrasing you would do wouldn't get the same point across as the original text. So sometimes the author has said something that's so original or so perfect or unique or rare that any sort of paraphrasing would not effectively depict the author's intended meaning. And so in this case, just go ahead and quote, and of course, be sure to cite it correctly, which Chris will talk about a little bit more later in the presentation. Um, the second time, or I guess the second appropriate time for when you would quote um, is when the quote is relevant to your work, right? So Amaris, Chris, and I, we've seen a couple papers in our days, um, and we have often seen students insert quotes that are not necessarily relevant to their topic or argument, and so obviously we wouldn't quote in that instance, right? But we've also seen students use quotes that are relevant to their topic, but not argument, right? So making sure that when you do quote, you quote both when it's relevant to the topic as well as to your argument. So for example, using my senior thesis that we discussed earlier, large sections and quotes from other theorists about gun violence while a related topic wouldn't necessarily be as relevant to my paper since I argue that Edward Azar's protracted social conflict theory is the best theory to understanding gun violence in the Caribbean region. So I wouldn't spend large amounts of time. I wouldn't really give other scholars a space to have like an official quote in my paper because I feel like that would take away from me saying that Edward Azar's theory is the best. Um, so make sure that you do quote when the quote is both relevant to your topic as well as to your argument. And then lastly, it's appropriate to quote um, when you want to lend authority and credibility to your own work. Of course, I want to kind of say this as an overall general statement. We are each budding scholars within our respective disciplines. So I want to make it known that we each already have credibility and authority um, and we should each stand in that. But it does help to also have quotes um, from other scholars in the discipline to show that you know what you're talking about, right? So for example, mentioning and using Azar's theory as I spoke about the different causes of gun violence helped me build my credibility and authority as a writer. So there are three areas where it's generally appropriate to quote when it's unique, when it's relevant, and also in general for when you want to lend authority and credibility to your work. Okay, next slide, Chris. Yeah. 
Awesome. So last thing, before moving on to discuss that second way we can integrate quotes, which is paraphrasing, um, Amaris and I wanted to share a few more tips and tricks on how to integrate quotes effectively. So as mentioned earlier in today's presentation, when you integrate a quote into your academic writing, um, you can't just drop the quote in. Um, so I'll you can, yeah, thank you, Chris. <laughs> you have to introduce the quote too. So normally um, we repeatedly use intro prompts or signal phrases such as according to, or the author writes, or, you know, the text says. Um, and I think we can all like raise our hands and say, we perhaps say that one time too much in our own papers. And sometimes it's, we generally think that there's nothing else that could be said, but there are actually truthfully so many other prompts available to us, such as the author acknowledges, the author emphasizes, the author urges. Um, and I have to just stop here for a quick second and give a massive shout out to Chris for sharing this resource with me as I was writing my own senior thesis, because I definitely had used according to one too many times. Um, and he was like, mm, maybe not Leah. And I was like, you're right. Um, and so I will be sure to drop it in the chat at the end of this um, presentation. So you all have that as well for you. And now you can just reference that document for tips on how best to incorporate your quotes into your academic writing. The next slide talks a little bit about um, another tip and trick, which we like to, we'll just phrase that as brackets, brackets, brackets. Um, you know, how to effectively integrate quotes into your um, essays, your academic writing is super important um, on a technical level, right? How do we make sure that we are, you know, inserting them um, accurately, either using brackets or block quotes? So first we're gonna talk a little bit about brackets. I'm sure many of you have seen them in your um, academic writing or in the text that you've read. And if you are unaware, those brackets actually serve some purpose to let your readers know when something has either been inserted or altered um, from the original quote or when you need to smoothly integrate a quote into your writing. Um, so I'm going to kind of run you through really quickly the three ways that brackets can be used, the first of them being when you want to clarify something. So on the screen, it reads, it driving imposes a heavy procedural workload on cognition that leaves little processing capacity available for other tasks. Um, and then of course it says um, where this quote was taken from. In this example, the word driving was not originally written in the quote, um, but it was included to help give the audience reading, which is us, um, context on what it is referring to. We would not have known what it was if we weren't reading the entire text in full, but not, we're not doing that. We're actually reading somebody else's work using this quote. And so it's gonna be super important for us as readers to know what it was referring to. And so the author decided to add in a bracket clarifying it. Um, and so this is an example of brackets being used to help clarify a quote. The second um, slide after this, the second time you would use um, brackets is when you are thinking of altering a quote. Um, so say you wanted to alter a quote to help with the overall flow of a quote into the text. Um, on the screen, you'll see, not coincidentally, drivers have been increasingly engaging in secondary tasks while driving. Um, separate from any piece of academic writing, this is a great quote, fantastic. However, imagine the person writing this quote, integrating it into an essay that's, let's say, is written in MLA style, right, which is traditionally written in the present tense. That means that the verbs have been would need to change to match the flow of the rest of the essay. So then the revised verbiage would look like what's on the bottom of the screen. Not coincidentally, drivers are increasingly engaging in secondary tasks while driving. Um, notice that this example that I've shown you and the one before and even the one after that we haven't gotten to yet, what we're changing is not the meaning of the quote, right? Which is super important to understand. What we're changing is some of the technical things that to help the quote better be integrated into our academic writing, which is the overall goal. And so here it was really more so about altering the verbs but the meaning intention still remains. And then the second, well, actually the third, excuse me, time that we would use um, brackets is when we want to integrate a quote. Um, so here, the quote that you see on the screen begins with a capitalized letter. The heavy cognitive workload of driving suggests that any secondary task has the potential to affect driver behavior. However, say you wanted to introduce this quote in the middle of a sentence, so you will need to change the capitalized letter to a lowercase letter. Um, and to do this, you would then need to put the lowercase t in a bracket, right? So then you would see it as it's written down below where the lowercase key, t has been replaced. 
well, has replaced the, the uppercase T. These things seem so technical, I know. I know they do. Even as I was doing it myself, I was like, Leah, come on, is this really important? But it is, it really is. Um, when you wanna think about one in general, integrating your quotes effectively so they read smoothly, but just in general too, it really does help to build your credibility and authority as a writer. When me as a reader can say, oh, you took this much detail um, to do these things. And it also shows me as a reader, oh, you know what you're talking about and you know how to write and how to effectively get your message across. And then the other tip or trick that we wanted to share besides the signal phrases, besides the brackets, is how to use block quotes. Um, so in short, if you have over a certain number of lines or words in a quote, you should separate this from the rest of your paragraph. Um, this, this, the way that you do this, however, depends on the citation style that you're using. Um, so for today, we've just decided to focus on AP and MLA because those kind of tend to be the main ones used on campus. But of course, it might change if you're history major using Chicago um, and so on and so forth. So for example, if you're using APA, the limit is 40 words. So if you have anything that's above 40 words, you're going to need to use a block quote. And this is what a block quote would look like um, through APA. So you would wanna pay close attention to the citation style. And if you're writing an APA, you will indent the quote. These are very specific instructions, which we will obviously share with you afterwards. So you don't have to write anything down, <laughs> but just know that if you're writing an APA, you will need to indent the quote like a half inch to the right of the margin, keeping the same double spacing format that you've used throughout the rest of your academic writing. And you would not want to add an extra line of spacing between the rest of the text and the quote. So as you can see here, here, an example on the screen, Jones 1999, their study, you know, found the following and then they separated that block quote, but still kept the spacing the same between the regular text and the quote. And of course, super important, you will also see that we have the um, parenthetical citation there and it's, it's um, written after the closing punctuation mark. And then the next slide, thank you guys, to format blocks in MLA, you will indent the entire quote. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. Are you paying close attention? You're going to, <laughs> indent, you're going to indent it um, an entire inch, not a half inch like in, in APA, an entire inch to the right of the margin, keeping in line with the same double spacing format. Um, and you will also insert the parenthetical citation after the closing punctuation mark. Um, and don't forget that. And then of course there are a few other rules as well on how best to format um, block quotes based on your citation. But for the sake of time, we decided to tell you what we kind of consider the most important. However, I have um, dropped in the chat here a link um, where you can learn more about block quoting block citations um, from Purdue OWL. And you can check that based on the different styles of citations, not just AP and MLA, but more so. So feel free to grab that link in the chat. So we have thrown a lot of information at you so far, um, but like I said, if you haven't been able to jot everything down or you're cooking or whatever it might be, don't worry. <laughs> we will share the resource with you. Um, and we also have uh, created a handout, shout out to the resource committee in the Center for Writing and Speaking that we will drop at the end of the chat as well. And it'll contain all of this information as well. So moving on, let's chat a little bit about the second way to integrate sources effectively, which is paraphrasing. Um, so I'm gonna use the same senior thesis example about gun violence in the Caribbean that I used earlier. This time, however, I will paraphrase the quote. So as a reminder, the quote was, as you'll see on that screen, the top half. Um, the original quote was developed in the 1970s. PSC argues that many conflicts currently active in the underdeveloped parts of the world are characterized by a blurred demarcation between internal and external sources and actors, multiple causal factors and dynamics reflected in changing goals, actors, and targets. Now, see what it looks like when it's paraphrased in the paragraph down below. Um, developed in the 1970s, PSC argues that conflicts in uh, developing nations exist because of internal and external factors that have ever evolving goals, agents, and interests. And then I'll ask Chris to flip to the next slide. This is what the um, paraphrase version would look like. And notice that you'll see the exact same colors as the earlier example at the beginning of the presentation. Um, 
And the reason is because you still need an introductory phrase, you still need an explanatory phrase, you still need a phrase that connects your um, kind of paraphrased version of a quote to your thesis, your argument, um, and your overall paper. The only thing that's different is that instead you're paraphrasing um, that quote. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for this slide, um, but feel free to drop any questions if you have that. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, hand this over to Amira so we can talk a little bit about when you paraphrase. Thank you, Leah. So a couple instances that you should paraphrase instead of um, using a direct quote. Um, the first one is generic language. Um, in this case, the language being used in the quote is pretty straightforward and is interchangeable. What I mean by interchangeable is that there are very common words that we use in our regular vocabulary that could replace the words being used in the quote. And in that case, you should be able to articulate that in your own words. Um, option, I mean, section, I mean, the second one, common knowledge, right? Um, the audience you're writing or speaking to has an adequate knowledge of what you're talking about. Um, so you may be talking to you know someone about your experiment that you've done in bio class and you may be speaking to the you know your actual bio class and your actual professor in that case you know you wouldn't have to cite the things that you know the people outside of your discipline wouldn't know because your audience already knows what you're talking about so you don't have to use direct quotes okay um the third one wording versus meaning um, in this case, um, you can paraphrase when the meaning of the word is more important than the wording. Um, typically, the way this shows up, the way that I've seen it, and I don't know if Chris and um, Lee have seen it in different ways, I usually see it as a stylistic choice in writing um, where, you know, students may want to or use quote specific language from the quote um, to add emphasis or stress certain language for, you know, a purpose or a point that they're trying to get across. Um, the fourth one is an accessible language. This kind of relates to um, the common knowledge one as well. Um, but in this instance, there is just a lot of heavy jargon that only the people in your discipline understand. So you wouldn't be able to go talk to a third grade class about your experiment because they have no idea what you're talking about with all this heavy jargon. Um, in that case, you want to go ahead and paraphrase and articulate it in a way where your audience can understand it. Um, and they have all the information and context that they need to understand it as well. Okay. So we can go to the next slide. And this is Leah. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so why do you paraphrase? Thank you, Maris, for the win. But the why, right, this is super important. This is almost like a little bit of our, the so what that professors constantly tell us that we have to write in our academic writing. We also have to give them in presentations. Um, so why do we paraphrase? Um, first and foremost, you want to paraphrase to present authority um, and show academic voice. When you paraphrase, you show your readers that you have a handle, you got a grasp on the material, that you clearly understand what you've read and are not able to digest it, and then also able to share it in an accessible way, right, for your audience, as Amira said before, which is super important to overall understanding. Um, and then second, you want to paraphrase because it helps to provide um, clarity. Actually, I think I switched those around. But um, you want to provide clarity, right? That's what happens when you paraphrase. Perhaps the author's original text was too confusing or unclear or just filled with a lot of jargon that was not really accessible. Um, you can decide to paraphrase. And of course, you will want to make sure that when you paraphrase, you still keep the author's intended meaning as true as possible, and that you also ensure that you cite um, the paraphrase as well, so that the students, the readers, whomever can revisit um, the author's uh, original text. Okay, and then I think there's one um, last slide that we will do, and then we'll hand this workshop over to Chris. Um, we just wanted to plug some of the resources on campus. Obviously, we threw a lot of information at you, and I'm just about to grab the resource that has all of this info um, and more, so that way you can have it for your own keeping. But even if the resource you feel like is still not enough, um, you can visit us at the Center for Writing and Speaking or visit the librarians um, at McCain Library. And on the handout that we're going to drop in the, um, the chat, it'll have uh, the links to where you can book with us. We are super, super, super um, eager to help you figure out the ways in which you can, um, you know, effectively integrate your sources at the Center for Writing and Speaking. Of course, we can help you develop your writing, develop presentations and speaking and things like that, but we can do the nitty gritty stuff as well um, to help ensure that you're effectively integrating either your quotes 
for um, paraphrasing. And I'll let Chris talk a little bit about um, how the library can help. And so McCain librarians are eager, eager to assist you with your research needs. And it's including not only locating resources, but also discussing potential topics and areas of review to help you locate resources specific to your needs. I think sometimes students um, aren't always aware that librarians will sit down, talk to you about your topic, and then think about the kind of resources you would need. So we can help you with topic formation and uh, fleshing those out also. And then on that handout that Leah's going to drop, there's a place where you can book an appointment with a librarian. Different librarians have different specialties here, like mine is um, political science, religion, and history. And then uh, Casey Long is going to be science, um, math, and some other areas. And Elizabeth Bagley is English and women's studies. So it'll give you those categories and who you can match up with. Or if you just have someone you're used to speaking to, certainly you can do that also. Um, and I was thinking, um, would since we're doing pretty good on time, before I transition, and it looks like there might be a couple of questions, do we want to answer a couple of questions? Would that be OK? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think we're doing pretty good on time, so. Yeah, and I'm going to drop the handout in the chat for folks right now. But yes, please feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself, or type the question in the chat if you have any about any of the content we've presented so far. And I, I want to say, too, there was a class I did, um, I don't know, maybe a month ago, and there was a student, and she hung around till after the class and said, oh, I have a question, but I don't want to ask in front of everyone else, and she asked me the question, and it was such a good question, and I wish she would have asked it in front of all the other students, because I think it would have been really helpful. So I know that sometimes there's things where you feel like, well, I don't want to ask this in front of a group of people, because I should already know this. And I think with what we're talking about today, a lot of this is not intuitive. Uh, there's no way that you would just magically know how to do these things. So if you are feeling um, a little overwhelmed, or, or, or you might be thinking, well, I, maybe I should already know these things, uh, don't, because there's probably everyone else has some more questions. And it's actually a question in the chat. Thank you, Ruby. Um, uh, Ruby asks, do you think you could speak a bit more about using brackets within a quote and guidelines for that? Sure, I think we actually do have some time to go back and revisit. So yeah. um, what I can do, and actually I'll recopy um, this. So we couldn't obviously talk about everything Ruby today, but um, once again, here is the link if you wanna learn a little bit more about um, brackets slash quotes, I mean, block citations. Um, but essentially, and you know, this is actually, Chris, I love that you mentioned that because for me, I will never, I mean, and it's also a little bit of laziness on my part. I would see brackets and I would go, what is going on mm -hmm. there in my, you know, like I was just like, what is going on over there? And in my head, I was like, okay, well, based on what I'm reading, <laughs> I was like, I think this is the reason as to why brackets actually exist and what, you know, their purpose is within a sentence. But it only was most recently when I began to do a lot more research for this presentation and just in general for my own writing that I really began to learn it for myself. So totally fine if you have um, questions. So like I had mentioned earlier, brackets are really meant to do kind of three things, clarify, integrate, or alter. So this example that's on the screen is for clarifying. Um, so say we took this quote um, from a text on driving safety or something like that, right? The author's original text said, it imposes a heavy procedural workload on cognition, such and such and such and such and such. And if I was reading that author's text, I would have immediately understood what it is, it is because perhaps the author decided to mention it in the sentence before or the sentence before before, right? However, if I'm taking that quote from the author's text and putting it into my own work, my readers will have no idea what it means because they don't get that same context because it's my work and I'm not like giving them the whole entire paragraph from that author's text, right? Um, and so to make it easier for my author and also technically easier for us, right? Because then we don't have to do a whole other sentence explaining the context. We can just say, it refers to driving, let's carry on. Um, I decided to insert a bracket, right? With driving, which will clarify it into the quote. I hope that made a little bit more sense. 
um, uh, let me know, Ruby, and I can also um, go on to the next slide while you type in the chat. Um, the other time we use brackets is when we're altering a quote. So like I mentioned before, you'll see the original quote up above and nothing was wrong with it. It was a totally perfect quote. However, let's say I was writing um, a paper on driving safety and my paper was in MLA. Um, I would then have wanted to um, take and alter the verbiage so that way it doesn't read awkward as I'm writing in present tense and the author's original verbs were have been in that first quote. So I changed the have been to um, are. And also I would have also switched the parenthetical and I realized I did not do that. So that was also something that you would want to do to make sure that MLA is all the way throughout. And then the last um, example is when you just want to effectively integrate a quote, um, which technically the earlier two examples, clarifying and altering is just another way of effectively integrating a quote. But this was the language that the resource used when I did my own research. I wanted to kind of replicate that. Um, but the first, this, this last example here, you'll see at the top of the screen, the original quote, once again, totally fine. However, when I wanted to integrate it into my own writing, I wanted to put it smack dab in the middle of a sentence. And it wouldn't have made sense for me to have an uppercase T um, after Salvucci and Tagen uh, proposed that. It wouldn't have made sense for me to have that capital T for the the. And so I just went ahead and tried to effectively integrate that quote by adding in that lowercase t. And I needed to add that in a bracket because that was my own change to the original quote, which we have to do in order to lend credibility to ourselves, making sure that we tell our audience that we did change the quote in a little way. But once again, don't change the meaning. Um, yeah, so hopefully that was um, a little bit more helpful. I saw that you said it was. So, um, but if you have any more questions, you know, as we said before, this is not just a, you attend one workshop and then you immediately have all this knowledge. Absolutely not. Um, so you can absolutely book an appointment with um, me, Amaris, other CWS tutors who I know some are on the call today um, or Chris um, or Liz or other librarians as well for help. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and if I can add too, I have seen where students sometimes don't understand that those brackets need to be used and will insert their own words without the brackets. And that by doing so, you could be modifying the meaning, which is very problematic. So those brackets help me as a reader understand, okay, the person writing this, this is their way of clarifying those points. But if they're not there and you're trying to make the sentence flow without those brackets, that could change the um, original intent of the author's words and can become very problematic and could turn into a kind of form of uh, misrepresentation or plagiarism. So yeah, it's not one of those things that um, sometimes you learn about early on, but they're definitely hugely important for just the flow of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Next, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite thing in the world, citations, right? <laughs> Everyone loves citations. And I should have put a citations slide here, but I didn't. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is consistent formatting. And oftentimes we see where students are using two or more citation styles to present works. Um, I've seen it in in-text citations and footnotes, so parenthetical citations also. And I've seen it in works cited. And the problem with that is if you do that, it becomes distracting to the reader because the reader starts to see one citation style and then another citation style. And really, your citations, they should not take prominence. The reader should be reading through the paper. You see the sources. If you want to go and look at those sources, you can because they're there for reference but they're distracting if they're not formatted properly or if there's different styles being used and things like that. So even though a lot of times we'll put emphasis on citations, formatting them and using them correctly is very important, but you don't actually want them to take prominence and errors are where they take prominence, take away from your primary work that you're presenting. Um, in this example, the student had basically, I think you all know, if you're using one of the databases, um, especially the ones in Galileo, you will find that they will make a citation for you and they, they do a decent job. Well, you have to choose the citation style. So in this case, MLA was used for one, Chicago was used for another, and then APA for another. That is a no-no. Now, this, the differences here are very subtle. You'd have to look 
kind of closely to know what they are. But again, as the reader, if I'm seeing this, it becomes kind of discombobulating. And what you also want is that when you're doing these citations, if you do have an error, like sometimes students have problems citing um, internet content, things that aren't from journals or books, because there can be some inconsistency there. I know this is going to sound odd, but you want the inconsistency to run through the work cited, because if I'm seeing, say we're using films and you're using films and you're citing them three different ways, again, it's kind of jarring because some information's there and some information isn't, and it becomes, it deflects from the quality of your paper. So just an example, and just so you know, again, the differences are subtle. That's why you always want to look at a guide, even if you're using something like a citation maker. I'm going to talk in a little bit about Zotero. If you haven't used that again, it's an excellent tool. I know some of you might use BibMe and things like that. I personally would steer clear of BibMe, Citation Manager, and others. Um, I, I find that they don't do a very good job, and you're going to have to do a lot, a lot of proofing afterwards. But even Zotero that we'll talk about is not perfect. You still have to proof those. So oftentimes when a citation manager is used, we find that there's some errors there. It'll be roughly correct, but it just needs, it needs a little more review to get it just right. And then also, as I was talking about, in the databases, oftentimes they will create citations for you too. They do a better job than things like BibMe or Citation Manager, but still, they're not always perfect. So bottom line is, when you're doing this, you need to be consistent and you need to review those by looking at an actual guide or handbook. And then in-text citation, again, students run into problems with this oftentimes. And the first one, and both of these are using, um, let me go down to my slide. Both of these are using MLA. So in the first one, psychologists Sharon Cohen notes, and then at the end, we have the page number where this comes from. So because I used Cohen to introduce this information, I don't have to put Cohen again next to 372. It's understood that that's the author I'm referring to when I go down to my works cited bibliography or reference sheet. On the other hand, in the one on the right, the relationship between celebrity and politics has grown as a tool for increasing personality brands based on notoriety, you see Cohen 372. Now again, this is just an in-text citation. I would want to introduce who this person is and why they have authority within that field. But just to understand, either when introducing that author and then putting the parenthetical citation at the end, or within that parenthetical citation, putting the author in the page, it has to be there. And we'll talk in a moment about when to use page numbers and when not to, but for the most part, you will. But if I can't match those up with my work cited bibliography, it's going to be a problem. And then when we cite specific, specific pages, and I oftentimes students have a problem with this. So if you are quoting a source or paraphrasing, quoting or paraphrasing from a specific passage in a book or a journal or an online web page or an interview with someone, you have to cite the page number. Now that said, I know that sometimes page numbers are not used in online sources. If that's the case, then you wouldn't be able to, but if all possible and there are page numbers noted, you have to put that page number in there because really the responsibility is on you to lead the reader to the section of the work that you're citing, I as the reader shouldn't have to go and find that passage. And that's where I was talking about earlier with citations. It's, it's up to you to clarify this information. It's not up to the reader. And when those page numbers aren't there, it draws attention to something that you don't want to draw attention to. And if you're referring to the work as a whole, so let's say you're giving a, if you're reading, um, Wuthering Heights, for some reason that came to my head. Let's say you're reading Wuthering Heights and you just give an overall three sentence summary overview of what the work's about. You wouldn't put those page numbers there because you're not referring to any specific part of the book. You're just giving an overview. So if you're giving an overview of something, then it's fine not to mention the pages. But if you know you're referring to a section of that work, something as specific as a quote or a paraphrase, or even an idea that's represented on a couple of pages, you really need to put those pages there. Again, the onerous is on you, not on the reader. And then this too, providing incorrect pages or no pages when they are needed, as I clarified above, is considered a form of plagiarism. And again, can't say this enough, 
the responsibility is on you, not the reader, to locate that information for them. And I think what's often uh, times overlooked is that when you're doing this work, you may use it, you can, might use it as a grad school writing sample. You may publish it on your own blog. Um, I know Leah has a, an article, at least one article that's been published. So in you, so you never know the work that you're going to do and where it's going to be published or where you're going to present it in other formats and other forms or even as a paper at a conference or something like that. So definitely think about that as you're doing that. Don't think about yourself and your professor as being the only audience. Think about, oh, I may use this in other ways. Therefore, I've got to make sure that these citations are done correctly. And then matching in-text citations in the work cited or bibliography. This is another area where we see problems. In this example, and this was um, a passage that was used before, psychologist Sharon Cohen notes, I have Cohen and I have 372. If I go down to my work cited and I go to Cohen, it's going to match. So I know from this to go here. Now, sometimes you're gonna have a work, like you maybe you're citing an online article and it doesn't have an author, but your citation begins with, like let's say this didn't have an author and it started with the age of celebrity politics. Here, I would need to put, the age of celebrity politics in quotations, and then 372 to tell you the page number it comes from. But whatever the lead element is here, it has to match with what is in the passage. If there's, if I'm, if I say Cohen, uh, like if I do this, and then I put the age of celebrity politics here, but then I go down here, but Cohen is the lead element, that's a problem. So they have to match. And that seems to be a pretty consistent problem when students don't match those up. Again, that's on you, not the reader, to match up the lead element from the word cited, or cited or bibliography, with what you're using within your parenthetical citation or footnote. Oh, I also um, wanted to put in and Amaris, if you could do that for me. The Purdue OWL has a great, some great um, examples and kind of worksheets for in-text formatting. So Amaris is going to put the one in for, there's a link for APA, there's a link for MLA, and there's a link for Chicago Notes and Bibliography. And Amaris will put that in there. It does a really good job of helping you with that. Because there are so many different ways you, you can put these in. And like this example here, matching game, you can see that Cohen, matches up over here with Cohen, that's MLA. This is Chicago because it uses a footnote. So this would be here. And then Christopher is using APA because I have the author's last name, the year, and then the page number. For us to do a whole overview of in-text citation in this session would be an hour in and of itself because there's so many nuances to how you can do this. But those links that Amaris is going to share will be super helpful for giving you examples of how you tie in these parenthetical citations or footnotes. Okay, and then citing statistics, um, oftentimes, we find that students are not citing statistics. I, I don't know if that comes from the idea that, that, that statistics are common knowledge and they rarely ever are. So for example, if you were talking about Joe Biden winning the, pres the 2020 presidency, you wouldn't cite that, that's common knowledge, he did. However, if you wanted to talk about the number of popular votes that Joe Biden had, or the number of electoral college votes. Even though that same information is published in a number of different places, it's still statistical information. You still wanna cite that, whether it's you're citing it from CNN or Fox or Gallup polls or Pew Research Center or wherever you might be citing it from. If their numbers, if their statistics, always cite them always cite them. There's there's really no way around that. Again, unless we're talking about something that's very obviously a year. And sometimes years can be contested too, and you need to cite those also. I don't wanna cause too much stress with what is common knowledge and what isn't. Ultimately, if you don't know if it's common knowledge or not, you should go ahead and cite it better. You're not gonna have points counted off for citing something when you didn't have to. You'll have points counted off if you didn't cite something that you should have. But just include statistics and numbers, just always think of those as something you should cite. 
And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is the tarot. And I don't know how many of you have used it, but if not, there's a link down here. And Zotero is a citation manager. It's free. You install it on your computer. You can also just use it. There's a cloud-based version also, but the one that you download to your computer is probably the better one. Um, and what it allows you to do is you can download citations from a database, from a book catalog, from an online, any online source. You'll put those citations into Zotero, and then what you can do with that is you'll collect them and then you can create bibliographies from them. You can sort them in a certain order. You can make notes. You can uh, add tags to them. There's all kinds of things you can do. And in that guide, it shows you both how to download Zotero, but then also kind of uh, more of the simpler aspects of using Zotero. And then it goes into more difficult areas of use. There's a lot you can do with Zotero. Um, there's some very basic uses and then you can get you can get pretty involved with it too if you want to it's easy to install like I said it's free there's other citation management tools some are free some you pay for this is the one that we support the most um, and librarians would be more than happy to help you walk you through Zotero whether it's getting installed or basic elements or moving on to more advanced ones and then one thing I thought, forgot in Amaris you may have already put these in there it's on slide 27. Um, but the Purdue Writing Owl also has excellent examples of APA, MLA, and Chicago Notes and Bibliography papers. This is a resource. I still look at these sometimes. I definitely refer students to them all the time just to say if the student's not sure about in text citations or how to cite something or with the block quotes, like how you should set those up. Those examples do a really good job of walking you through how to format these papers. They're, they're a real paper that have been formatted, then notes have been added and other things. And it makes it uh, super easy to understand that all in one place, because you know we're throwing so much information at you. We wanted to say thank you for joining. Uh, we know that included a lot of information. And as um, Leah and Amara said before, we are all here to help you, help you troubleshoot some of the things that may be a little more uh, stressful or complicated or just, mm, I'm not totally getting that concept or just to review things that that's really what we're here for. And does anyone have any other questions or is there anything that we didn't um, expand on? Just drop the handout in the chat again for folks so you can go ahead and download that to your own computers and get all of this information in a little more, more bite-sized um, format too. And then I'll also, um, once this is the presentations uploaded to the Skill Builder site, so probably on Monday, I'll take everyone that attended today and I will send that information. Uh, I'll send you the, the slideshow and um, that'll include our notes and a recording of the presentation too. Mm -hmm. Give a beat for some questions. You all did such an amazing job that all questions <laughs> have been <laughs> answered. Everyone's ready to write those papers. They're invigorated, energized. <laughs> if you disagree with me, <laughs> go ahead and ask a question. Yeah, but if you don't have any questions right now or can't think of them off the top of your head, you know, as we said before, we are all here as resources for you in, in the library as well as in the Center for Writing and Speaking. That handout has information on where you can book appointments with either of us. Um, and so, you know, as you begin to write and you realize, oh, I can't remember what Chris said about this or what Amara said about this, you can always book an appointment with us too. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Hey, thank you. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.